Now you're combining the data, you're putting together a bundle and you're combining the data from Hulu, Disney Plus and ESPN Plus. Now, before Snowflake, would that literally have been possible to do that kind of thing and that sharing in that way? It would have been really hard. I mean, you know, I think we would probably have to use a third party. You know, I've done this in my previous lives. It has been pretty difficult. This was much, much easier and more seamless than I've done in the past. Now, I want to add, ask you to put on your visionary hat and look into the future five years or more. How do you see data changing the entertainment streaming business over these next few years? You know, the streaming business is in a period of great change. And I think one of the things that will determine who is successful is the streaming service that understands its customers really well and figures out how to buy, build content that really resonates with them. And for that, I think we're really going to need to have the underlying infrastructure for them to be able to leverage this understanding of the data and of the content and how it interconnects across the product uh, product and tech. And that's something that I think over the next five years, you will see. In the newspapers, you're going to see more about content producers and content and things like that. The apparent fights will be over that. But I think the battle will be won or lost by the streaming company that really understands their customer needs and provides solutions for those needs. Now, in your career, you've worked in a wide array of industries. You've been at Walmart, Amazon, eBay, in the banking industry, in the insurance industry. So you've had an incredibly broad array of experiences as a data professional. How do you see data transforming the world of business more broadly? Some of the industries I've been in have been, you know, users of data for a long, long time. The, you know, the banking industry has leveraged data very well for 50 plus years. I think what we are seeing more and more is creating new businesses that are based on the fact that we can leverage vast amounts of data and create products out of it. You know, like 15-ish years ago, the Google, Facebook, Twitters, they really would not be possible without their ability to crunch enormous amount of data and create uh, customer experiences or customer products that were useful to their customers and now ubiquitous, right? Like, I can't see myself living without Google. You see that in the case of, you know, a lot of these gig economy type companies, it wouldn't be possible for them to really create those businesses without data. So my thought is that, you know, as technologies get better, as our ability to consume larger amount of data gets better, as our algorithms, our ability to really look at data with a 360 perspective, I think that will create new products and services, things that we may not have imagined before, right? I mean, there are many things that even I as a data professional would not think were possible 10, 12, 15 years ago. So I think we'll see a lot of advancement, I hope, on the healthcare space. Uh, That's where I see a lot of folks talking about, you know, how data can really transform an industry that has been pretty siloed, has been pretty pretty conservative about leveraging data because of all of the privacy concerns around data and so on. But I think as we've gone through uh, the pandemic and as we're trying to think about, you know, if we had data, would we be able to do contact tracing much more easily? How does one do that? You know, how do you create those kinds of products? That's an area that I think is pretty ripe for innovation. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a freelance writer and I write in, in various fields, information technology and, and healthcare and medical science, especially. 
And I interviewed a woman today who's a professor at Yale and head of geriatrics at Yale New Haven Hospital, which is right down the road from me. And she was talking about something. Basically, you know, they have electronic medical records now. But the whole medical industry was based on this idea of the doc, all these specialists knowing how to take care of this disease and this organ in your body. And they've never really looked at the patient holistically, or they, they, and they never looked at the patient as a, essentially a consumer or a customer of theirs mm -hmm. who might have their own opinion about things. So there is actually this big movement in healthcare right now around, you know, surprise, surprise, asking the patient what they want right, and how they want to live and, and coordinating, sharing data between the specialists and the internist and, and coordinating care in that way. And it's just like, you know, it seems so obvious. And for someone like you coming up through these industries where the focus has been for so many years on, on the 360 view, and uh, it is coming to healthcare. It is coming to healthcare. I have a patient at Stanford, and they've done a fairly interesting set of work around trying to put all of your visits, all of your diagnosis, you know, your prescriptions, things like that in one area where, you know, you have access to your records. It's just easy for, when you go to a specialist for them to take a look at other things that might be pertinent to whatever it is that you've gone to see them that, you know, if you're if your PCH hasn't written that up somewhere, they can go in and look at other records in the past to see if they can leverage that. And that I think is, that's kind of the way I think we will go out in the future. And I see that, you know, in developed nations, I think, you know, that's definitely something that we need to do. But I see that in, you know, well, not really third world country. I don't call India third world country truly, but it is uh, to a certain extent that, you know, over there, everything is so disorganized that there's a lot of folks that are trying to figure out how to connect all of these dots, especially for rural India, where I think there will be, you know, it would be one of the best things that they can do for, for rural India to see how healthcare can be connected so that people that really don't have any access or don't have the education to tell the doctors about what a previous doctor might have told them or trying to explain their symptoms and things like that. Those are areas that I think are also very ripe for innovation. Yeah, I look forward. I mean, it seems like the world is, in terms of technology, in terms of business innovation, is really in kind of a golden age. Now, obviously, we have lots of other problems surrounding us, COVID and, and other stresses. But it, it does seem like technology is really in a position to help deal with stresses, but also deal with some of these opportunities. I, you know, I didn't ask you about artificial intelligence is that something that you're really using aggressively at Hulu at this point? Yeah, with our scale, you know, we cannot really do things without machine learning, right? Our recommendation engine, our search, uh, a lot of our marketing campaigns all run off of machine learning. We do a lot of things in just understanding, leveraging machine learning to understand indicators to you know, some customer event like churn, for example, or reduction in engagement or things like that. So we use it fairly, fairly aggressively, I think. You know, it's, it's just, again, a tool that you use with a lot of understanding about the customer and about our business. So we've been fairly judicious about how we use uh, machine learning. So it's not like a, a magic pill you use for everything. No, we don't. In fact, like even our recommendations, which typically people, you know, hand over to the machine, 
we've been very, very, in some sense, conservative, but in some sense, we know that our editors have really deep knowledge of our content and they have deep knowledge of, you know, the industry in general, they're able to leverage these zeitgeist moments. And so we've, we have a combination of editorial and machine driven recommendations and personalizations. So we've been very thoughtful about not having black boxes that we are not able to interpret and understand what's happening. I think that's very smart. And, you know, I I think the terminology that's being used most commonly is augmented intelligence or AI augmented intelligence to make it clear that you need these, these smart analysts their insights are going to are going to be critical, and yeah, you can't just have this black box that kind of turns it into a commodity or just turns it into a machine. You also have to double check the machine to make sure that the recommendations or insights that are coming out of it really are sound, right? Yep, they're sound, and you know, like you've got to, you know, you've got to understand how you train the algorithm. You have to understand, you know, are you so precise that you know, it's not the best thing to do as well. So how do you add a little bit of generalization into the model? The other thing that I think, you know, you talked about analysts that understand what the algorithm is doing, but I think you also need business people who believe in the power of data. Like at Hulu, I think I've been just amazingly fortunate that I have business partners that, you know, believe that data can make their processes better and are able to lean into operationalizing a lot of the data insights that we provide to them. Even these algorithms, I mean, you can build them and they can sit on the shelf unless someone actually says, yep, I know how to use them. I know how it can make a difference to my business. So I think an educated business partner is, you know, more than half the battle won if you have that. Now, that's I think it's sometimes called data. Well, it's it's interest, but there's also data literacy. I mean, do companies like Hulu actually kind of train executives to understand data better and, and the power of it and, and how to access it? I think one of the reasons that we created this role was to make sure that the data team, if the business teams weren't as savvy that we brought this learning, if you will, or training, if you will, with us to help our execs and more than our execs, right? The people that are on the ground that are actually running the business on a day-to-day basis to educate them on how to leverage data and, you know, when they needed to use their intuition, their Uh, knowledge of the industry and how they supplement it with data. Sometimes they lean into the data more so because they may not have experience when we're doing new products and things like that. So just trying to figure that one out and help train our business partners, that was a big part of my job when I joined uh, the company. Mm -hmm. I, I just wonder about executives. I mean, there's all this mythology about the executives and how they make decisions and kind of their gut instinct. A lot of people do trust their gut. But, you know, there's all this knowledge these days about implicit bias, about all sorts of things, and that in a sense you almost can't trust your gut. Do you see kind of an evolution in the way C-suite leaders are doing their jobs and, and making decisions? You know, as we think, uh, as we say, you know, augmented intelligence, you can also think of it having all of these data insights as augmented instincts, right? They're able to look at areas of where they instinctively think is the right decision. They're able to see with insights whether that is indeed the right decision or not, right? There could be alarm bells that ring that, nope, that's not the right thing. All the data suggests that that's not the right thing. I think having that availability of those data insights is good for them. You know, who am I to say, you know, someone's instinct isn't great. All I can do is provide insights that 
allow them to, you know, either be comfortable with their uh, decision or, you know, take a second look at their decision. Well, that's really interesting. It's almost like they, they might start with an instinct and then just have the, the be conditioned now to check it and then only move ahead with it if they really find a lot of evidence to back it up. Yeah. And you don't want someone to just go by the data, right? Like uh, you're bringing people in with their different perspective and different knowledge of the industry. So you want to leverage both and you've got to try and find ways to do that. And I think for me, it's more fun when, you know, the data insights are used with uh, their instinct and gut than it is just as a mechanism to try new things just based on data. Yeah. Now, Jaya, I think you've used the word fun at least two, maybe three times in our conversation today. So, and I really enjoy the kind of the spirit with which you go at your job. You clearly have a good time at it. And I think that's something that uh, everybody could learn from as well. And I want to thank you so much for your time today you know, your stories about how, how you proceeded and, and, and the role you have and about the insights that people in the company are getting and the sharing between um, Hulu, Disney Plus, and ESPN Plus. I think those are all really valuable insights that a lot of people will be interested in. Thank you so much for your time today. No, thank you so much. I uh, really enjoyed talking to you. That does it for this episode of Rise of the Data Cloud. Thank you for listening. This episode is brought to you by Snowflake. To see how you can get secure and easy access to any data with near infinite scalability, visit snowflake.com.